the love of the tropics is fecund and cruel. In an area of roughly 150 square kilometers in the northwest of Cambodia, the remnants of the Khmer civilization of Angkor lie entranced in its mortal embrace. The site of many of the capitals of the dynasty, whose turn of glory came between the 9th and 14th centuries AD, it is the repository of superb architectural realizations of man's belief in his divine moorings. Originally Hindu in orientation, the temples later commingled Buddha with Vishnu and Shiva. Of all the temples of Angkor, Angkor Wat stands preeminent and today largely restored. It is the classical apex of Khmer achievement. It is the Pratibim of Mount Meru, the axis of the world and the home of the gods. The concept of Pratibimb was inherited from India. It encompasses the idea of making an earthly representation of a heavenly form. At the representation of Mount Meru, the temple was dedicated to Vishnu and was the symbolic center of the universe. Simultaneously, Angkor Wat served as the center of the kingdom on earth of its builder king, Surya Varman II. The temple was the locus of the cult of Devaraj, or God King, through which the king's sacred personality, the very essence of the kingdom, was worshipped. Crossing over from life to the greater life beyond death, Angkor Wat is also a funerary temple, where its great builder was posthumously deified as Lord Vishnu himself, the preserver and protector. Situated directly beneath the main tower, rearing 200 feet above the ground, the central shrine, now occupied by Buddhas, is the communion cell of God and man. From here radiated the energy which spanned an empire extending from the South China Sea to the Bay of Bandon to the south and to the west bordering the Pagan kingdoms along the Irrawaddy.
The center of Mount Meru is the center of the universe. In Hindu Brahmani cosmology, the cosmic mount is encircled by six concentric continents and seven oceans, the last bordered by a great rock wall. The alternation of galleries and courtyards analogically represents this primordial scheme. While the gradual descent of the monument, from its summit to its broad foundations in the Angkor Plain, echoes the adjustment of the vertical cosmic principle to the lateral terrestrial plane. Angkor Wat is a schematic version of the Temple Mountain, with its concentric series of oceans and mountain ranges surrounding the five peaks of Mount Meru. The architectural geometry is essentially the rectangle and the cruciform, variegated by the freestanding libraries, the roof lines and the ritual quadrant tanks. Pratibim denotes more than a symbol, more than an abstract representation. It is rather a living image, for an image can only receive a cult if it is alive. In this sense, which transcends the figurative, Angkor is a living abode. The 1,753 Apsaras who animate its walls are not mere embellishments. The Apsaras are female divinities, celestial nymphs and dancers, created for the pleasure and entertainment of the gods. Often unexpectedly encountered, sometimes overlooked, but always present, they are the inhabitants of the heavenly home. On the exterior face of the monument, bas reliefs contour a course of episodes more than half a mile long. Suryavarman II, an audience. There are scenes from the Indian epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana.
the war between Ram and Ravana. There is a singular quality about these reliefs. They capture not so much movement as the essence of movement. The indeterminate light of the monument suggests not time, not timelessness, but rather the gravid presence of time yet to be. On Meru, motion and time exist in perennial suspension as latencies. This is the death of Vali at the hands of Ram, to the dismay of his monkey courtiers. The Samudramantha or churning of the ocean's creation myth, where the demons and the gods collaborate, grasping both ends of the serpent's body to rotate the mountain and extract Amrit, the vital elixir. association with their builder king, these reliefs detail several other Vaishnavite and Puranic themes. Graven into the sky, accenting the verticality of the monument, tympani at the ends of vaulted roofs provide naga bordered surfaces for sculptural depiction. These are Hindu legends of Shiva and Parvati. The story of the wounding of Lakshmana by Indrajit. Naga balustrades flanking the entrance causeway are specific to Khmer architecture. In Hindu cosmology, the mystic Nagas or water serpents are linked to the rainbow. They are the bridge between heaven and earth, providing access from the realm of mortals to that of the gods.
watched over by lions, the causeway is the route to the sacred domain of Meru, the pathway to divine communion. It is water which energized the majesty of the civilization of Angkor through vast irrigation networks. The waters of the ocean moat finally enclose this unique Khmer articulation of the Brahmanic cosmos. The light of ancient glory still lingers on the undulant surfaces of stone recalled memory. The role of Angkor in Khmer consciousness is not limited to tradition and past greatness. It is a beacon which beckons to the future, a promise based on a world achieved, that the wheel will turn and bring back what seems. In the tragic desolations of its recent and continuing history, an irretrievably lost wholeness of life and creative achievement. I pay homage to India and the Indian people for the restoration of our dearest heritage with our ancestors got from India. They have sent a wonderful team who are doing a very good work. Every Cambodian must be grateful to them for taking on this enormous task under difficult conditions. Nigh on a millennium old, it renews itself from the deepest aspirations of the people. Angkor Wat remains at the center of Cambodian consciousness. In 1986, the Archaeological Survey of India, at the invitation of the government of Cambodia, came to resume the work of conservation. The operation involves 400 Cambodian workers under the technical supervision of some 15 to 20 Indian archaeologists and other specialists. Two million man hours of conservation has already been completed by the Indian team. All material supplies are ferried over from India by the Indian government. The team work in difficult, often arduous conditions during the six dry winter months each year when work is possible. Problems intrinsic to a war-torn country, still under the threat of the Khmer Rouge, are compounded by the language barrier, isolation, and the absence of medical facilities. Over the centuries, war and greed have taken their toll of Angkor. But the exactions of nature, while infinitely more alluring, have also been more structurally damaging. Earlier conservancy work by the French had attempted to contain the problems of the monument by providing iron brackets and supporting buttresses for the damaged and tilting pillars.
circumstances of war had, however, compelled the French to withdraw in the early 70s, and Ancourt had been left unattended till 1986, when the ASI team started work here again. Conservation of a monument has three stages. In the first stage, somehow save the monument. In the second stage, conserve whatever say, uh, things, uh, things are there, conserve them. And in the third stage, make the monument look aesthetically beautiful. So these are the three stages. First stage, the French people are in the first stage, we can say. And we are in second and third stages. Conservation today demands both chemical and physical procedures. Made of sandstone and laterite, it is highly susceptible to water percolation. Insect excavations have allowed vegetation to take root in the gaps between stones. With time, the roof stones have been dislodged and other architectural members disturbed. In the humid climate, algae, lichen, and moss abound, making the sculpted surface of the soft stone disintegrate. To stop this irreversible corrosion, the accumulated acids must be neutralized with an alkaline solution. The chemical process may take up to three painstaking days for a badly infected square meter of stone. 70,000 square meters have been cleaned and sealed. Chemical conservation is a delicate and precise operation. The procedures and chemicals used by the ASI are in accordance with international standards. First, we, uh, we will remove the uh, accretions on the surface by the uh, sword brushes. Then we will apply a uh, 1 to 2 percent solution of ammonia mixed with tea pot. And we will allow to soak, soak the solution on the surface. And then uh, by the sword brushing, we will remove the accretions slowly. After the cleaning, we will wait for a certain time to observe the, what is the effect of atmosphere on the clean surface. And uh, after, after uh, observing the effect, effect of atmosphere on the clean surface, we will apply a fungicide, which will uh, remove the uh, traces of uh, vegetational growth which are left on the surface. And after, after application of fungicide, we will apply a preservative, that is polymethyl methacrylate in tolly. We will use uh, generally 2 to 3 percent solution. And uh, it will form a transparent layer on the surface, it is also water repellent and it will consolidate the surface also. And if we want to remove the layer after some years, it, we can remove it easily. So suppose some accretions will set up on the preservative layer and there will be no, no effect on the original stone. Once the grime of centuries is removed, the stones return to their original brownish color. The most demanding aspect of physical conservation concerns the inner and outer line of pillars. These pillars circle the monument, supporting the main vaulted roof and the overhanging semi-vaulted roof. The pillars supporting these roofs are not of equal height. Under the weight of the heavy stone roof, many of them are listing severely and are a source of continuing concern. 
Today, the tilting pillars show the effects magnified by a thousand years of weight and weather. In some places, the pillars have been dismantled for complete turnkey reconstruction and restoration. Builders of Angkor relied on weight, gravity, and a good fit between the stones. Mortar was not used. Earlier efforts at physical restoration had assumed substantial erosion and damage to the foundations of Angkor Wat. The Indian team found no evidence of this. Restoring the roof is crucial to protect the sculpted and finely worked interior of the monument from the elements. But this problem was not understood properly by anybody. They all thought pillars have sunk, so this problem has come. And almost all pillars have sunk. And that is why all the beams are cracked. But my argument was, this phenomena cannot happen in complete gallery. And all the galleries have this phenomena. So in the original construction itself, they have made mistake. The pillar, they have selected shorter pillars. So this portion was different, and this portion was different. Uh, they did not use one tie beam. Instead of one tie beam, they had two portions in that. Now we solve this problem very, sim uh, very simply. What we are going to do? We remove this beam, take it up. We s see the horizontality, perfect horizontality of this piece, this uh, portion, and this portion, and then bring this pillar to plumb. Tie this portion and this portion with, um, see, dowel, and these portions also, the beams with dowels. Tie them up. So from tying up all the beams, now the whole portion becomes one unit. So all the members will be taking equal thrust and weight. So nothing is going to happen. Stones from the semi-vaulted roofs are first removed to give free play to the tie beams and supporting pillars. tie beam is raised, delicately and carefully. The degree that the pillar is out of plumb or tilts is carefully measured. The outer beams lining the gallery are raised next. As the weight of the tie beams and the semi-vaulted roof is lifted, the verticality of the pillar is largely restored. After accurate correction, the pillar is fixed into position and the tie beams are lowered. Now the idea he brought you. 
The miracle happens. The ravages of time and faults with the original construction are reversed. Concealed dowels will ensure that for at least some time to come, the problem will not recur. Once restoration and repair of the pillars is completed, their base decoration, where it has been eroded by accumulated water seepage, is replicated with cement casts. See, it should blend with the monument, blend with the whole monument, and aesthetically it should be Good, but we will definitely indicate that it is not original. That should be there. People should not think that this is the original one. No, we somewhere or the other, either in color or in texture, somewhere we give indication that it is not original. See, crevices are filled up with uh, cement water so that no water goes inside. Now this is grouting. By doing this, no vegetation can grow on the monument. We do not want water to go inside the structure, either to the foundation or to the core. So all the gaps are filled up. We have used cement for producing or modeling some of the pillars, some of the beams, some of the architectural members. If we had not done that, we would not have reconstructed the, that portion. For example, Samudramantan gallery, three, four pillars were missing. If we had not See, molded the pillars and put them in their position. It was not possible to reconstruct Samudramathan gallery at all. We wanted to make stone pillars and put, but stone is not available now. Quarries have been abandoned because of this fight. French team had, uh, say, dismantled the whole, uh, say, uh, roof, pillars, and then this uh, semi-vaulted roof, everything they had dismantled. The, only this wall was existing. Even the flooring they had dismantled. So we had to put back all the architectural members of this uh, gallery. Say we had to erect all the pillars and then put back the beams and then the roof, everything, in including the uh, flanking entrances. That also we completed last year. It was a massive work. See, more than 2,000 stones and architectural members we had to put back. That was a major work. 
We are uh, reconstructing this porch. This porch had been uh, dismantled uh, by a French team before 1970. Uh, since then, all the stones were lying on the ground and uh, nobody had bothered to reconstruct it. Now we are reconstructing and now the, this stone will go and sit on the top of this porch. So this is the last one because other stones are missing. Even before uh, the French uh, team dismantled, those stones were not there. So whatever stones were available, we have used and we have reconstructed. Culturally, Kampuchea and India are very close and the monument is also very close to us in architecture, in spirit, everything. So we, we feel proud to do it. We love this monument. After all, this is our culture, our brotherly country. They wanted this temple to be protected, see, preserved. We felt it is our it is our heritage. Indians might not have constructed, but our spirit is here. So we have to protect this, preserve this. Hey, bro! Oh, quick, 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 How should Angkor Wat be conserved? Frozen in a lowering decay, provisionally strengthened against the ardors of the elements, or restored to something close to its original state? It is a collaborative effort, as the Cambodian workers work together with the Indian team to recreate not merely the majesty and physicality of a monument, but with their hands and their craft, revive the spirit of which they are the inheritors. The Indian commitment has been to restore its structural stability with the least possible disruption to the original texture and feel of the monument. Ankorvat 
is a tribute and a testament to the people of Cambodia. In the end, rock. Explaining nothing, justifying nothing. It is because it is. Tat Tvam Asi. This is the presence of Angkor. More wholly its own witness than man can ever be. It lives on at the very heart of the people of Cambodia and a vital monument to our global heritage.